He's laid into Donald Trump before, but tonight President Obama took the gloves off. The Republican candidate was woefully unprepared. He said, indeed, more than that, he was unfit for office. A Republican nominee is unfit uh, to serve as president. Uh, I said so last week, and uh, he keeps on proving it. Mr. Trump, meanwhile, told the mother of a crying infant at one of his rallies, you can get that child out of here. Another day, another charm offensive. Also on News at 10 tonight. The Iraqis are pushing so-called Islamic State back, but the result may be a million more refugees on the road north. New statistics suggest the building trade is paying a price for Brexit, so will interest rates be cut? The dark side of Rio, rising crime and a police force that appears to shoot first and ask questions later. And a wonderful odyssey, the musician who's made good on his mission to play every cathedral organ in the land. This is ITV News at 10 with Tom Bradby. Good evening. There must be lots of people in America Donald Trump hasn't insulted yet, but it does sometimes feel like he's doing his best. Today, he told the mother of a crying baby at one of his rallies to get out. That's the spirit. And yet nothing and no one has yet managed to derail his bid for the White House. That said, his decision to insult the family of a Muslim American army officer killed in Iraq does appear to be causing him some trouble. President Obama said today he was not only woefully unprepared, but actually unfit for office, as you can perhaps imagine by now. Mr Trump wasn't taking that lying down. Mr Donald J. Trump. Even by his standards as the great American maverick, Donald Trump's attacks are becoming ever more outlandish. This was his assault on Hillary Clinton just a few hours ago. I mean, here's a woman who's a total thief. I mean, she's a crook. She's a crook. And she lies more than any human being I've ever seen. There has to come a point at which you say, enough. And in some of the strongest words we've ever heard a president utter about a potential successor, Mr. Obama gave a brutally simple answer to the question of whether Donald Trump is unqualified for the Oval Office. Uh, yes, I think the Republican nominee is unfit uh, to serve as president. Uh, I said so last week, and uh, he keeps on proving it. it. Means that he's woefully unprepared uh, to do this job. If you think it's hateful, that's your it opinion. It is hateful. It is hell. Divide everybody, man. And yet amid this storm, amid the arguments breaking out everywhere Trump goes, the question remains whether his opponents now gain fresh momentum and his poll numbers collapse. Trump certainly has a core of supporters who remain loyal through every gaffe and blunder. Some see him not as a politician, but as the leader of an insurrection. Honey, we're on a revolution. You either decide to get in it or get out of it. You want to be in it? Oh, I'm in it, honey. I'm 80 years old. And for this reason right here, for my grandchildren, it's going to get better. Have you even read the United States Constitution? Even the controversy raging over Trump's attack on Kaiser Khan, a grieving Muslim-American father who lost his son in Iraq, has not put off Trump's advocates, who see it as a trap by the media and Democrats. Well, I don't think there's a reason to apologize to them. I mean, they put themselves in the political arena. Do, does he not need to apologize? I'm not going to say that he needs to apologize, no. I don't know. Is, it, is that an issue that might change the way you vote? No. Not at all? No, not at all. There is now mounting pressure on Republican leaders not just to distance themselves from Donald Trump, but to actually reverse their endorsements, to take a stance against their own standard bearer. Many, like Senator McCain, are in an exquisitely painful political space. What will Mr. Trump have to do for you to change your mind about him? Oh, that's a speculation I'm not going to engage in. Come on. They are shocked, but they need Trump supporters in their own fierce re-election battles. Donald Trump has become a political wrecking ball, but his supporters insist he's the only man who can change America's direction. 
And Robert joins us now from Washington. A political wrecking ball, you say, Robert, uh, and a predictably robust response to President Obama from Donald Trump tonight. That's right. I mean, Donald Trump's mantra has always been that if he's hit, he's going to hit back 10 times harder. And so he has tried to do so uh, tonight on a Facebook page. He has accused President Obama and Hillary Clinton of destabilizing the Middle East, of handing Iraq and Syria and Libya over to ISIS. He says that uh, America has been humiliated overseas. And he's tweeted out in the last hour that, in his view, President Obama will be viewed as perhaps the worst president in American history. Look, we know uh, that Donald Trump has been astoundingly resilient. We've predicted his demise many times, but it does seem now that the, there is a, a, a growing political cost. The first Republican congressman has come out, broken ranks, and said that he will now vote for Hillary Clinton. And the latest poll shows that uh, Hillary Clinton is now eight points ahead of Donald Trump, suggesting that centrist voters are breaking towards the Democrats. OK, Robert, uh, for now at least, thank you very much indeed. Now, Robert was mentioning Iraq there, and we've talked a lot on News at 10 about the slow and painful fight back against the group calling itself Islamic State in Syria, in Libya, on last night's programme, for example, and in Iraq itself. Well, despite recent advances by Iraqi and Kurdish forces, IS still controls a substantial area of northern Iraq, including the strategically important city of Mosul, which has a population of around a million. The next target for government forces on the road to Mosul is the town of Garaya. But with the fighting comes a familiar byproduct, flight, with thousands of civilians desperately trying to get away and find some kind of safety in the crowded refugee camps, like this one at Dabaga. It was set up earlier this year with space to shelter up to 5,000 refugees, but already it is home to more than 26,000 people. And significantly, given what we saw with all those refugees on the move this time last year, analysts warn as many as a million more people may soon be fleeing the fighting as the battle for Mosul itself begins. The race is on in the refugee camps of northern Iraq. They're already so full that people know getting as close as possible to the front of the queue is an imperative in case there aren't enough handouts to go round. This camp is the sad byproduct of defeating the barbarians of the Islamic State. As their cruel caliphate shrinks, the number of civilians fleeing the fighting grows every day. Abu Omar and his family fled their IS-held village along with 200 other residents whom he crammed into the back of his lorry. A neighbor who stayed sent him pictures of the home he left behind. IS blew it up as punishment for escaping. Abu Omar told me material things didn't matter, only family did. We spent two years under IS and all the time we feared they might kill us, he said. As the Iraqi army pushes IS back, a wake of destruction is left behind. No wonder civilians are fleeing this. The next objective for advancing forces is a town shrouded in darkness. Not only is Gaiara strategic, it's sufficiently oil-rich for IS to send it up in smoke to obscure the view of coalition pilots. When the Iraqi army managed to take Gaiara, it will be their biggest win yet in the advance towards the city of Mosul. But victory will come at a price. One of those costs will be the creation of something like 5,000 more refugees, the residents of the town. And what will happen when the battle for Mosul itself begins? The expectation is that up to a million more civilians will descend on camps like this, a place barely coping with 30,000. Sort of blown my mind, the scale of the problem here. Actor Ewan McGregor is trying to help those displaced by war. How concerned are you that following a spate of attacks in Europe, the well of sympathy for refugees in the UK is running dry? Well, it, it, it is a concern, and I'm going to do everything I can with my work with UNICEF to try and make sure that it doesn't. And these people are people that are fleeing. They've lost everything. They've lost their homes. They're, they're, a lot of children I've met have lost their family. They've been split up. They don't know where they are. They're suffering from ISIS. They're fleeing from ISIS. They're suffering too.
and um, they still need our help. The quest to defeat IS is heralding in a new set of problems for this tortured country. Already in dire trouble, it would be a mistake to assume it can't get any worse. John Irvine, News at 10, Northern Iraq. Well, whether refugees like those we've just seen are escaping the fighting in northern Iraq or Syria, some end up, of course, wanting to come to Europe, including the UK, for a better life. Back in January, a judge said three Syrian teenagers and a man with mental health problems should be allowed to join their families who were already here. But the Home Office, led then by Theresa May, appealed, saying it would simply encourage more to follow. Today, the Home Office won its case. <laughs> this was the reaction of three teenagers and one of their brothers when in January they were told they could resettle with their families in the UK. Until that point, home for these four Syrian refugees had been what few people would call a home, the squalor of the migrant camp in Calais most often referred to as the jungle. The Home Office, when Theresa May was in charge there, appealed against that decision by a UK judge. Today, it won. It could be a year before some of them get here. That's another winter in devastating, horrible conditions and dangerous conditions in the jungle camp or what's left of it. And they're under the prey of traffickers and risking life and limb. The decision earlier this year raised the hopes of the 150 children living here without parents. Those hopes have now been dashed. Under an EU law called the Dublin Regulation, asylum claims must be made in the first country in which a refugee arrives. However, unaccompanied children who have claimed asylum can then apply to another country like the UK if they have relatives legally living there. The Home Office argued that procedure was not followed because these four refugees did not apply for asylum in France, where the backlog is huge. I think it's deeply disappointing that the Conservative government is trying to wriggle out of the responsibility that we surely have to desperate people fleeing from persecution and torture. The four people in question, two of them have been tortured, all of them have witnessed absolutely appalling things uh, whilst they were in Syria. The Home Office says 30 children have been accepted since the most recent Immigration Act and others with families here will be considered. But the journey to the UK for these lone children will now be a longer one. Chris Ship News at 10. And in Syria itself today, another reminder of the severity of the war with evidence of a chemical weapons attack in a rebel-held area. Pictures from Idlib province appear to show people being treated for the effects of gas. Rescue workers say a helicopter dropped containers overnight close to where a Russian military transport helicopter was brought down yesterday. 33 people needed treatment for what is suspected uh, as chlorine gas. There are plenty of treatments the NHS pays for to keep people healthy. Flu jabs, vaccinations and gastric bans, just to name a couple of examples. But NHS England has insisted it should not have to pay for a drug that protects people against the HIV virus. The cost could be up to £20 million a year. But a court ruled today that the NHS did have an obligation to consider offering the drug. It is a deadly disease and there is no known cure. 30 years ago, this was the terrifying message on HIV and AIDS. But now there's a drug that helps to prevent catching the virus. A High Court ruling today marks a step nearer NHS England funding that drug known as PrEP. Alex Corsten Ronaldson was diagnosed as HIV positive more than two years ago. He believes the drug PrEP could have protected him from the virus. I get fantastic support from the NHS because I've been diagnosed and because I'm being treated for the condition. But why they don't seem to want to cross that line and prevent it when there is a medication out there that could categorically stop the spread of HIV in our lifetime and they're not doing it. Campaigners argue the PrEP drug opens a new front in the fight against HIV. It's really the first time there's been an innovation in HIV of this magnitude since antiretroviral therapy in the 1990s and so it really if it's commissioned properly and targeted right at people at high risk it really has the chance to turn the tide. PrEP costs £400 per month per person. The drug is taken once a day like the contraceptive pill for women. If it was funded by NHS England it could cost up to £20 million a year. 
In comparison, NHS England spends £16 billion on drugs and specialised services, like cancer treatment. In the last year, nearly half a billion pounds of that was used by the Cancer Drugs Fund. There are other diseases and conditions that we need to prioritise the resources of the NHS for. So PrEP, subject to the appeal, will be seen and considered alongside 13 other treatments. The safe sex message remains crucial as NHS England reviews the evidence on the drug PrEP. Neil Connery, News at 10. In a show of respect and affection by France's Roman Catholic Church, mass ranks of fellow clergy joined parishioners for the funeral of Father Jacques Hamel today. Father Hamel was, of course, the priest who was murdered last week. The backdrop for the service was the grandeur of Rouen Cathedral, a few miles from the local church where Father Hamel was holding morning mass when Islamic terrorists walked in. A week after his brutal murder, thousands came to mourn Father Jacques Hamel. Outside Rouen Cathedral, they stood in the rain, anxious to pay respects to a man killed because of his religion. Inside, they heard tributes to a gentleman. A priest, the Archbishop said, who'd wanted to unite people. Also a man of courage, Father Jacques, seen here preaching, had shouted, get away, Satan, as he fought back even after his throat had been cut. Interior Minister Bernard Cazeneuve represented the government. This was seen not just as an attack against an elderly man, but as an assault against a nation. But this was also a day for a family robbed of a dear uncle. His niece distressed as she recalled urging tolerance in the wake of Charlie Hebdo, never thinking she too would face this horror. And his sister remembered a brother who refused to be promoted to the rank of an officer when he was serving in Algeria. But then he would have to give the order to his men to kill others and he categorically refused to do that. Categoric. A public farewell ending with a red stole being laid on top of Father Jacques' coffin in recognition of his sacrifice. He was borne out to applause from people unwilling to allow his death to divide them. Juliet Bremner, News at 10. One postscript to the service during that account by the priest's sister of his military service. She described how he was the sole French survivor of a battle in Algeria. He often asked, apparently, why him? The answer, she said, was clear. God had chosen him for the service of others. Now, for the past few years, barely a month has gone by without a rise in house prices. Great news for homeowners, perhaps, but not for anyone hoping to buy. Small or non-existent wage rises have only added to the problem. But a new report out today said that home ownership in England has actually fallen to its lowest level for 30 years. It was a former prime minister who wanted everyone in Britain to measure their success by owning their own home. If you've been a council tenant for at least three years, you'll have the right by law to buy your house, and that's that. Right, come on in. I'll show you the property. But three decades on, and home ownership is at its lowest level in a generation. So the first floor is... Fewer people have their own property than at any point in the last 30 years, and it's not just in London where they're being priced out. Martin's looking for his own place in Manchester after moving here from London. He says for first-time buyers, the challenges are huge from buy-to-let investors loaded with cash. When I first came up here, I did look at apartments, and that, that was just ridiculous. I mean, they were, they were gone almost as they came onto the marketplace. People almost had agents saying, when the next one comes on, you know, here's my details, I'll just take it. In 2003, the average price for a property in Greater Manchester was just below £85,000. Twelve years later, it had more than doubled, but average wages had only risen by just over 40%. No wonder then that fewer people are getting on the ladder, down nearly 15% over the 12-year period. Bricks and mortar have always been a British obsession, but the right-to-buy scheme ended in Scotland last month 
and in the debate over how many new homes could and should be built, the answer is always more. In 2009, we built the lowest number of homes in this country since the 1920s. And we still are. Uh, well, no, it's, no it, was a, it was at about 80,000, 90,000 then, and it's now up to about 170,000 new dwellings in the last year. So we've got a standard two-bed terrace property here. So this house terraced. in Bolton is on the market for just yeah, over 70,000 and is attracting now. interest from buy to let investors, but the agent selling says they can be outbid. What enables the first-time buyers is that they, they're falling in love with the property, so they're not, they're not talking from the head, they're talking from the heart. Therefore, an investor from the head will pay less, from the heart they'll pay a bit more. So the only way to be sure is to pay more, and if you can't afford it, you're shut out. Damon Green, News at 10, Manchester. And if building houses is the answer, that would certainly help the construction industry. It is experiencing its fastest contraction for seven years, which is, of course, food for thought for the Bank of England as it decides whether to cut interest rates on Thursday. Our business editor, Joel Hills, is here. Um, Joel, uh, is this Brexit, this contraction, in your view? Up to a point, yeah, almost certainly. Uh, the Purchasing Managers Index, Tom, a, a survey of purchasing managers, is an attempt to sort of gauge the business mood and look at what intentions are regarding hiring and firing. And and we get excited about it as journalists because the Bank of England gets excited about it as a pretty good indicator of which way the wind is blowing. Yesterday, the PMI figures for manufacturing were disappointing. Today, they showed that activity in the construction sector had slowed and that jobs were being lost. Now, it's too early to assess the full impact, the economic impact mm. of Brexit, but it, there's compelling evidence here that at best the economy is slowing, at worst it's gone into a Okay, reverse. interest rates are already very low, as we know. Will they go lower at the end of this week? Almost certainly. The Bank of England has indicated that it's worried that, faced with all the uncertainty the referendum has thrown up, that businesses and households sit on their hands. It's determined to do something eye-catching. Eye it will probably cut borrowing by cutting interest rates. It may also dust off the funding for lending scheme and expand its policy of QE, creating money and pushing it out into the economy. Now, remember, Boris Johnson, before the referendum, told us there would not be an economic shock if we voted to leave the EU. He was wrong. The Bank of England is now wrestling to contain it. We don't know what the price mm. of the uh, vote to leave the EU will be, but there will be one. It may not be big, and some people, of course, will argue that it's worth paying. OK, Joel, thank you very much uh, indeed. Now, despite all the promises about a safe Olympics, there has, in fact, been a rise in crime on the streets of Rio de Janeiro in the lead-up to the Games. Some blame Brazil's struggling economy. The police and army response, well, to shoot first and ask questions later, it seems. For the last couple of months, police have shot dead the equivalent of more than one person every single day. In a back alley of this Olympic city, a mother and grandfather mourn. <laughs> On this corner, their boy was gunned down, not by a gangster, but by police. I say the crooks, they are the ones in uniform. Jonathan was 16 years old. He'd gone to fetch popcorn for a family party. A friend filmed moments after he was shot at point-blank range. Witnesses say his hands had been raised in surrender. The last time I saw him, he was on a stretcher. His head was bandaged. There were all sorts of tubes in him. Then I never saw him again. Rio has deployed 85,000 security personnel to counter terrorism and to deter the city's battalion of street thieves. It's also meant more of this, military police moving into the city's lawless slums, steep streets where drug gangs rule. This looks less like a police operation and more like an army of occupation. And appearances are not deceptive because in Rio's slums ahead of the games, a war has been raging and many are the casualties caught in the crossfire. This stop and search for weapons and drugs is not far from an Olympic stadium. Police tell us they have brought order, though at a terrible price in life on both sides of the line. We kill a lot of people, but we die too much, too. Only this year we have more than 63 policemen dead working, so it's, it's, it's a hard place to work. And when the police move in, it can be hard to tell the good guys from the bad. 
Here you can see in this area 17 shootings just in one week. Campaigners say police have been on a pre-games killing spree. If you enter a neighborhood where a lot of people live and you simply enter shooting, people will be killed, people will get shot, they will be hurt. On a wall at the end of his street, friends have painted Jonathan as an angel. He'd been looking forward to the games, his mother told me. Now all we have are tears. John Ray, News at 10, Rio. Friday's opening ceremony is fast approaching, but the Russian team is no nearer to knowing who will and who won't be competing. Uh, our sports editor, Steve Scott, is at the Olympic Stadium. Um, no news on Russia, it seems, Steve, but better news for one British medal hopeful. Yeah, that's right. Lizzie Armitstead, world champion and favourite for Sunday's road race. She uh, was threatened with a two-year ban because she missed three out-of-competition doping tests inside a 12-month period. She challenged one of those missed tests on procedural grounds. The Court of Arbitration for Sport uh, agreed with her. So the ban was never initiated. In a statement today, she said, I have always been and always will be a clean athlete. Nevertheless, the fact that she escaped this ban uh, on a technicality has raised a few eyebrows. Some former and current athletes have pointed out today quite publicly that they've only ever missed one or two tests in the end their entire careers. Now, while all this has been going on, as you say, still hundreds of Russians don't know whether they're going to be competing in these games. And while those decisions are being made, People at the top of sport here are having an almighty row about who is responsible for this mess. And I think that's one thing we can agree on. It is a mess. And frankly, it's staggering that you and I are having this conversation when we're, what, three days away before the opening ceremony. OK, it is a bit. But thank you, Steve. We'll see you tomorrow. And finally, something uplifting to end tonight's programme, the soaring sound of organ music. It was the lofty ambition of retired tax inspector John Richards to play the organ in each of Britain's 94 cathedrals. He has just completed his musical tour. You could say he pulled out all the stops. Some journeys are planned, others just happen. John Richards never imagined he would play all 94 cathedral organs in England, Wales and Scotland. But after almost 20 years, his extraordinary journey is now complete. I've done from Truro, the most southern, to the most northern, which is Kirkwell in the Orkneys. We've done them all in between, yeah, sideways. But we've done it all. It's been, it's been absolutely great. But this adventure was born out of tragedy. When his first wife, Barbara, died suddenly, John lost both his love and his love of music. Fortunately, his second wife recognised his grief and Lynn enlisted the nation's cathedrals to help him find his music again. What I saw in the early days was what you would call a broken man. What grief can do to a person, it stops them still in their tracks, as they say. And I thought, what can we do to get this back? You can't say, oh, off you go and play. It doesn't work like that. And it was, it was just, I wanted the music to come back and play through him. That's what I wanted. With Lynn asking the cathedrals for their help and permission, and John agreeing to give it a go, the pair began their tour in 1997. His musical journey has taken in the northern ivories of Edinburgh to the southern pipes of Truro. And there's been some famous places and faces along the way. He's played at both Westminster Abbey and St Paul's Cathedral, and even met former Prime Minister and accomplished organist Ted Heath after testing out the organ in Salisbury. And, as he found out last week in Orkney, his musical journey often has unintended consequences for those who happen to have heard him play. A woman sat there in a wheelchair and she came on to me and she said, it's the funeral of my brother today and I wasn't able to go. But one of the hymns on that uh, sheet was, the Lord's my shepherd. And when I came into the cathedral today, you were playing it. You know, it's, it's moments like that that um, can be very touching. Ireland, North and South are in his sights. But for now, the organist with no formal qualification, but more experience than most, simply plans to keep on playing, wherever he may be. Rupert Evelyn, News at 10, Brecon Cathedral. An unusual story, but what a soothing way to deal with grief. That's it uh, for tonight's News at 10. I will be back tomorrow. Hope you will be too, so to speak. But for now, good night.
and thanks very much for watching.